morning, everybody. Hey, take your Bibles and turn to 1 Chronicles chapter 29. I know you live in Chronicles, so you know exactly where that is. For those of you that are new to Christ, it's in the Old Testament. Uh, my wife is not here with me this morning. She, Colleen is just leaving on a plane to Hong Kong, and she's about to embark on a journey throughout Asia. She's going to Cambodia, Thailand, doing women's conferences, so I would appreciate you praying over her this week because it's a pretty big week for her. We are in a series called Simplify, and we're talking about money. We're talking about the subject of money, the most addressed, talked about subject in the Bible five times more than any other subject in the Bible because most people, when they, when they start developing a relationship with God, they have to make the great exchange from worshiping money to worshiping God. And most people don't understand the difference. They think they can worship both. And that's why Jesus makes it really clear, you cannot serve God and money. And so the, the idea of this, this particular series is to kind of simplify God's teachings on money. And whenever you talk about money, sometimes people in the church get all uptight and know oh, that pastor is going to try to manipulate us and get us to do something that we don't want to do. And, and let me just assure you, I'm not going to try to manipulate you. I'm not going to try to get you to do anything that you don't want to do. Everything that we teach here is designed to help you, not manipulate you. And so I'm here to help you. And, I, and, and this is some things that I've learned over the 30 plus years of being a Christian about money. Uh, that have helped me tremendously, and part of it is just this, this whole idea of giving. Giving is a part of money, and when you think about giving, you have to understand, and just a few minutes ago, we received our tithes and offerings, and it was kind of low-key. We don't make a big deal out of it on Sunday morning because we try to teach you ahead of time how to think about that particular part of the service, but in reality... Without that in the service, without that part of the service, which is one of the most important parts of the service, without that, we have no church, we have no staff, we have no outreach, we have no helping the poor, we have no missions. Your giving in a church, in this church or any other church, determines the level of that vision coming to pass in that church. So it asks, in essence, the giving portion of the service, even though it's a small portion of the service where the bucket comes by and you make a, a, an offering or you tithe your, your tithe for that week or you give online and you, you, you do that on a regular basis, that determines almost everything that we do as a church. So it's very important that we get this down in our church, amen? Because the more we are able to understand the principles of giving, the more effective we are as a church. I can talk to you all day about vision, but if it doesn't have any money, it's nothing but a pipe dream. And every church's vision is limited by the giving of that church. So based on how we give, and by the way, let me commend you, we are a giving church. You wouldn't be sitting in a building like this unless you were a giving church. You wouldn't see the expression of outreach that this church get, does except that you're a giving church. The average church in America, they've done a study on this, the average church in America has less than 10% of its people tithing to their local church. Less than 10%. In this church, it's over 50, over, really over 60% of the church are faithful in their tithes and offerings. So we're able to do quite a bit in this church. We, we are an unusual church in our giving. Now, that doesn't mean we're doing the peak of what we can do. We can always do better. I'm still after you 40%. Because there's, I don't want anybody in the church to miss this principle because this is really the key to a lot of other things in our Christian walk. So I sat down and I started thinking through the principles of stewardship. We talked about last week about making the value shift. Today I want to talk to you about the heart of giving. As I started studying giving in my early days of Christianity, one of my favorite Bible characters was David. And I like David, not just because he was a great king and a great leader and a psalmist, and he wrote all the, you know, most of the Psalms. He, he's just, he, he obviously was the only one in the Bible that actually says, had a heart after God. It says that in the book of Acts, that David had a heart after God. It doesn't say that about anybody else. So I really wanted to study his heart, and I was reading through the book of Chronicles, and it's kind of the story 
of David's ending of life as he draws to the end of his life and he's building this temple for God. His son Solomon would ultimately take it over, but he's, he's the initiator. And they have this big offering. They, they didn't have pledges or anything like that. They just brought their best offering for the temple to build this temple. And he starts it off by giving this incredible offering from his own personal treasury and you can study it out in 1 Chronicles 28. You can see what he did. And they say that if you take the money, the gold, the talents, all the things that he brought, that it was equivalent in modern-day currency to somewhere around $3 billion that he gave from his own personal treasury just for one building project. Come on, somebody. Say amen. amen. I don't know anybody that's ever done that in the history of the world since then or before that. It's the biggest what I consider to be the biggest gift for a building fund offering that I've ever heard of. All right, now don't worry, I'm not raising money for a building, so I'm not gonna ask you for that. I'm just telling you the story so you can get the picture. So he gives this big offering, and then the, 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 the leaders, the other leaders in the community gave, and they paid for this temple, paid for it, built it debt-free. After they gave this offering, David makes this statement in Chronicles that's, that's quite amazing, and I wanna read it because I think it goes right to the heart of a giver, and here's what it says in 1 Chronicles 29, verse 12. It says, wealth and honor come from you alone. All right, now let's just pause on that thought right now. Any, any wealth that you accumulate in the earth, any honor that you get with that wealth, you, you need to recognize as a believer in Christ that it comes from God, it's not from you. And you, I know it's hard because people give you the credit for success in your life, but the reality of it is, is you would have no wealth or honor without God's anointing on your life. And God anoints business people just as much as he anoints preachers. You have anointing in the business world to make money. The Bible says the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just, and he wants people in the working community understanding that when you go out to work every day, you are working not for yourself, but as unto the Lord. You're not working to please men, you're working to please God. That's why you can have a terrible boss and still do a good job. Because you're not working for men and a man's approval, you're working unto the Lord. And when you work, you're working to bring wages into your life to prosper you so that you can be a pro person that gives a lot. So he says, wealth and honor come from you alone for you rule over everything. Power and might are in your hand and at your discretion, People are made great and given strength. Oh, our God, we thank you and we praise your glorious name, but who am I and who are my people that we could give anything to you? I want you to think about this statement. This is a statement coming from, at this time, the wealthiest person in the world, the Bill Gates of the Bible. He is the wealthiest person in the world and he's saying, who am I? When was the last time you heard a billionaire say, who am I? But he's, he's taking this position of lowliness and humility, recognizing that everything I have is coming from you. And then he says, who am I and who are, we, who are my people that we could give anything to you? Everything we have has come from you and we give you only what you first gave us. In other words, we're just giving back to you what you already gave to us. Now right there, the heart of the giver is he's recognizing I don't own anything God, you're the owner of it all, and I'm simply giving back to you what you already gave to me. It's sort of like you gave your kids money to buy Christmas presents for you. They bring you the Christmas present, and they're all proud about what they got you, and they don't realize that the money they bought it with is the money you gave them. Think about that next time you give to the Lord. Because a lot of times we struggle with giving to the Lord. We struggle with giving to our local church. We struggle and we don't realize the reason we're struggling is because we are owning it. We think it's our money. It's my money and I want it now. <laughs> but that's not, that's not how David thought about it because he had the heart of a giver. So I'm, I'm on this journey in my early 20s trying to learn how to give. And I, I recognize that God had done something in my heart when I became a Christian. When I follow, started following Jesus, I became born again at the age of 22. I, I had lived most of my life with the idea that I want to make a lot of money. I want to become a wealthy person, and I want to be a business person. And I had a business at 22, and I was making a lot of money. 
And when I came to the Lord, it, 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 something happened inside of my heart that shifted. I started making what I talked about last week, the value shift, and I received the gift of giving. Now, not everyone has the gift of giving. The gift of giving is when you have this extraordinary ability to give way past your tithe and offering, where you give extraordinary. You live to give. You think more about giving than any other way that you think about money. And not many people have that, but for some reason, God gave me that gift to think that way and to function that way. And so tithing and giving was never a struggle for me ever from the day I got saved. But I recognize that some of you are here and some of you watching us online, you might struggle with giving. You might struggle with tithing. You might struggle with the whole concept of it or giving, and it might be a challenge for you. And, and part of the reason you might struggle is you just maybe don't understand why we give, why we give. So I started going through this thought process of why do I give? Why did David give? And I came up with about 20 reasons why I think I give to the Lord, why it's, it's a part of me to give. And I recognize I can't go through 20 reasons in a service, so I, I boiled it down to the top five reasons why I give why a person gives, and this is at the heart of a giver, and so it'll help you navigate your own heart and see where you, your heart is in this area. And let me just say this, if you're already sort of got your wall up, kind of resisting, here, let me tell you why. Because money is, is, is ruling over you instead of you ruling over it. And you don't even know it. Sometimes you don't recognize it because money has this seductive power to it. The, Jesus said it's called deceitfulness of riches. Deceitfulness means it can deceive you and you don't even know it's deceiving you. All right, so I went through this process and I came up with the five, five reasons why I give. I'm just gonna give them to you in the order that the Lord gave them to me. The first reason why I give, I believe why David gives, I believe why anybody is a giver, is I give because I wanna demonstrate a thankful heart to God at all times. Now I recognize that as I prosper, it's, it's possible that I could get to the place where I stop being thankful for what God has done in my life. It's, this is what David was trying to say to God. He said, yeah, I'm a very wealthy person, but I want you to understand that I recognize that everything comes from you and I am simply giving back to you what already belongs to you, and I am just wanting to demonstrate to you how thankful I am for what you've done in my life. Now, I look back on my life when I was in my early 20s, before I got saved, my 20, 21, my grandfather passed away, and my grandfather was a very wealthy businessman. He was a corporate lawyer in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. He lived on a golf course. He lived the country club life. He had a beautiful car, beautiful home. He owned a yacht. He had a really big life, and at the age of 63, he died of lung cancer. And I was standing at his gravesite with, his, with the family. He was an atheist. And when I was standing at his gravesite, nobody could say anything about him. They had nothing to say about him because he pretty much lived his whole life for money. So we all went home that day, and I got back in the car, drove back out to the gravesite, and stood there. And I had a conversation with God, even though I wasn't a follower of Jesus, I knew who Jesus was and I knew who God was. So I started talking to God about my grandfather and I said, Lord, I know I'm not serving you, but I do not wanna end up like this. I don't wanna end up in the grave where there is nothing to be said about my life other than I made a lot of money. And so it marked me. It, it, it marked me, and a few years later when I would come to this surrender with Jesus, I realized that every time I come before the Lord, I want to thank him. I want to thank him for sparing me that kind of life. I want to thank him for rescuing me from my sins. I want to thank him for delivering me from the curses of my family. I want to thank him for putting me on a course where God's blessing is in my life instead of all these problems that most of my family had, and the only way I can think that I can thank him besides just serving him is giving to him, 
And so every time I give, you understand this, this is the heart of a giver. Every time you give, you're giving with this expression, God, I just want to thank you. I wanna thank you. And here's what I know about people that don't give. What I know about people that don't give is they don't have a thankful heart. They might say they have a thankful heart. I see people come to church all the time. They got their hands lifted. I love you, Jesus. I praise you, God. But when it comes time to give, wait a minute. <laughs> now you're talking about something that's dear to my heart, my money. You see, every time we address that when it's time to give, it is addressing something in our heart. Proverbs 4, verse 23 says, above all else, guard your heart, for out of it flow all your issues. Everything in your life flows from your heart. And then Jesus says this about your heart in Matthew 6, 21, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What you do with your money tells God all he needs to know about your heart. If you're not a giver, that tells God that your heart is not with him. Your heart is for yourself or your heart is for other things in the earth, it's not for God. So I, I, I had this thing in my heart, I said, God, I wanna make sure that you understand every day how thankful I am for what you have done in my life. And the way I can express it is by giving back to you what you've already given me. All right, so that's the first reason I give. The second reason I give is because I wanna make sure that I have a surrendered heart before God. Now, <clears throat> there are two kinds of people that come to church on the weekends in every service, and I recognize this. I, I saw this from the moment I got saved and started going to church. There are givers and there are takers. In every congregation, there are givers and there are takers. And I recognize that the, the givers in the church, they're demonstrating, I'm surrendered to God. God, you are my God. Money is not my God. Takers, on the other hand, are generally not surrendered to God. It's funny, it's kind of like the, the Lord showed this to me in an illustration one time, just a visual illustration of baptism. He said, you know how some people, they'll get baptized in water. They'll go down the old, they'll come up the new. But he said, sometimes what happens is they're not fully surrendered. So when they go down, they're holding this above the water. <laughs> their wallet or their purse is above the water. They don't let it go all the way under. Some of us here need a baptism of our wallets and purses. Did you hear what I just said? Where everything that's, that's, that we have control of here is fully surrendered to God. Now why would I wanna do that? Because I wanna make sure that I'm surrendered to the one who instructs me to be a giver. The one who I love and serve, you can't get away from the fact that he's instructing us constantly to be a giver. He says in the book of Acts chapter 20, verse 35, it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. And then he says over in Matthew 6, 19, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust corrupt and thieves break into steel, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust don't break through and don't corrupt. And he says, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So every time I'm giving, what I'm saying to the Lord is, Lord, I'm surrendering everything to you. I'm surrendering my heart to you. My heart belongs to you. So every time I have an opportunity to give, I'm saying to God, God, you're in charge. I'm not in charge. Now, some people struggle with that. I understand that. Some people struggle with that because maybe money means too much to you. Some people say, well, I don't have enough money to give. Some people say, do you know what my tithe would be if I get? I have so much money, my tithe is too big. I remember one time when we, we used to interview new members years ago when, when we had time to do that, when the church was smaller and I was sitting in front of a business person and we, one of the things that we ask our members to do is commit to tithe to, their church, to the church. You say, you ask people to commit to tithe to be a member of the church? Absolutely. You say, aren't you afraid that you're going to lose people when you ask them to commit to tithe? I said, not, not one bit. I said, think about it. Who do we lose when we ask them to commit to tithe? 
We lose people who don't tithe. What did we lose? <laughs> we lost a person who just takes up a seat, who just sits there, but doesn't participate in the vision. Are you following me? Yeah, I, I, you know, I don't ha- we don't have time to play games with that. We've got church business, God business to do in the earth, and I don't have time to apologize for the gospel. This is what Jesus said to do, and we're just going to say it and, and let it fall like it may. So I'm sitting there with this man, and he says, Dennis, he says, I'm a very wealthy person. He said, now, I used to tithe, and then when I started making this kind of money, I mean, that's kind of hard because when I write the check, it's big. I said, it used to not be hard, but now it's hard for me to tithe. And I said, you, you got to understand, I don't know how to give that kind of money. That's a lot of money because my tithe is big. And I said, well, let me do this. I said, let me pray for you. He said, all right. And I said, Lord, I said, Lord, would you help this man become poor again (laughs) so that it's easy for him to tithe now? He said, don't pray that prayer. (laughs) He got the point. The point is sometimes we think we make too much or sometimes we don't think we make enough. And a lot of people... They think that that God's okay with that, and he's not. He wants to make sure your heart is with him, whether you're poor or rich. It doesn't make any difference. In fact, he says the richer you are, the harder it is to keep your heart with me. So this is why when we give our tithes and our offerings, we're saying, Lord, I fully surrender everything to you. All right, the third reason I give is because I want to position myself and my family under God's blessings and protection. Now, this one I want to take a little time with because this is important. When I started this journey with God, I recognized that a lot of people in the church don't tithe. Now, let me give you the definition of the tithe. The tithe is the first, write this down if you're taking notes, the first 10% of all that you're increased, your profit in life. You sell a house. Let's say you sell a house. And let's say your profit, after all your payments and all the you know, what you've invested in the house, you look, what did I profit on that house? Let's say you made $10,000 on the house. Your profit is $10,000, so the tithe is $1,000. You get somebody to give you $100 for a birthday gift. The tithe is $10, the first of all of your increase. You go to work and you get paid a salary. Let's say you get paid a salary of $3,000 a month, and that's your That's your income. That includes everything before taxes. You make $3,000 a month. What is your tithe? Some people say, well, let me wait till after taxes. Really? I'm pretty sure taxes are a bill just like a car note or a house note. I'm pretty sure that's a bill, isn't it? So why do we tithe after taxes? Then we're not giving God the first. We're giving him after taxes. We're giving him And not the first of everything that we're increased. So I said, okay, God, show me the reason why you want us to do this. And he took me all the way back to Genesis, the beginning of humanity. And he said, I want you to notice something that happened in the book of Genesis with Adam and Eve. He said, in Adam and Eve, I put them in a garden and I told them to be a steward over it, to tend it, to watch over it. He said, but I put one thing in the middle of that garden called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which I reserved for myself. It's holy, not to touch it. He said, don't touch of that tree, don't eat of it, and everything else you can partake of. It was a type and shadow of things to come. And yet we know the story. Adam and Eve, they partook of it because Satan said, has God really said you shall not eat of it, shall not take of it? Has God really said you need to tithe? And and so they, they partook of it, and it says that God then came and he pronounced a curse over human humankind. And part of the curse, he says to Adam, is cursed is the ground for your sake. Now, this is important to understand this principle. This is really good. When you get this, you'll learn a lot about tithing. Cursed is the ground for your sake, and in it you will toil night and day. In other words, you're going to work by the sweat of your brow just trying to grind out a living. If you're working by the sweat of your brow just trying to grind out a living... That's a sign you're living under the curse. You're living under the curse. So from that point on, humanity lived under the curse 
until God began to bring his people forth and establish a covenant, starting with Abraham. Abraham comes on the scene as God's leading man of faith to eventually form the nation of Israel. Out of his loins would come Isaac, Jacob, and others. And he said, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. And the first thing that Abraham does is when he wins a battle, he takes all the goods and it says he brings a tithe unto the high priest Melchizedek. The tithe, again, is the first 10% of everything that he's increased. And he gives it to the high priest Melchizedek. When you look up Melchizedek, you'll see that Melchizedek was a type and a shadow of Jesus. Without a beginning and without an end, it says. He was a high priest without a beginning, without an end. In other words, the creator. He brings it to Melchizedek way before the law was ever established in the Old Testament. And he doesn't tithe by the law. He tithes by faith. He doesn't tithe because he has to. He tithes because he gets to. He looks at it completely different than people under the law. And he's giving this to God, saying to God, God, I'm bringing this to you to let you know you have first place in my heart. And the Bible says God then used the high priest Melchizedek to bless Abraham. And from that moment forward, if you'll follow and trace the life of Abraham, everything he did was blessed. What happened was God blessed him and removed the curse off of his ground. Then we see Moses come on the scene and he brings the whole concept of the tithe into the land of Israel. He tells the Israelites that this is a part of the principle of God's favor and this is how he's going to bless us as a people by our tithing, by our giving. So we're always going to bring the first of everything, our crops, our animals, everything. We're going to bring it to the Lord. We're going to present it to the Lord so that God can bless our land. So he can bless our hands, so he can bless the fruit of our womb, so he can bless the fruit of our body, so he can bless every part of our life, so that he can remove the curse that's on the ground off of our life. Now I want you to think about it. There's a curse that's still on the ground. The way he redeems the curse is through the tithe and the offering. And so every person on this earth lives under that curse until they get this principle. Sometimes the curse is not that they don't have money, it's that they have a bad marriage. Their children start serving a, another God. They have failed in their physical health. They might have all their money, but they die early. Lots of curses. Everything you have, listen to me, comes from the ground. The money you have, if you have money like this, where did that money come from? It comes from the ground comes from trees that came from the ground. The house you live in comes from the ground. The car you drive comes from the ground. Everything comes from the ground, including you. Your body came from the ground. Originally, your body was formed from the dust of the ground through Adam. And when your body dies, your body does not go to heaven. It goes right back into the ground. So it has more to do than just finances. It's about your health, it's about your family, it's about protection and all this. So then you fast forward to the very end of the Old Testament where Israel has now fallen away from God, backslidden, they've stopped serving God and now God's hand is off them. They're living under the curse of the world of which Satan rules over. By the way, Satan rules over the little God of this earth he rules over the economic systems of this world, and he takes Jesus up in Luke 4, and he shows him all the kingdoms of the world, and he says, if you will bow down and worship me, I can give you all these kingdoms. In other words, he had the power to distribute to whoever he wanted to control their lives. And so God institutes this thing with Israel. He says, you're a chosen people. I'm going to show you how to tithe so you break the curse on the ground. Well, they fall away from God. They stop tithing. They stop giving. They stop serving God. So they start divorcing their wives. They start having broken families. Their health starts to deteriorate. Their life starts to be, now they're in captivity again. And so God calls them back through the prophets. Return to me, he says through Malachi. Return to me and I will return to you. And so the, the Israelites say, how do we return to you? And he makes this incredible statement right at the end 
of the Old Testament, right before there's 400 years of silence in Malachi chapter 3. In Malachi chapter 3, here's what he says. It's a powerful statement. You've probably heard it before, but maybe not in this context. And here's what he says in verse 8. Begin, if you want to return to me, begin by being honest. Do honest people rob God? Let me ask you that question. Do honest people rob God? What's your answer? Of course not. But what is he going to follow with? Yet you rob me day after day. You ask, how have we robbed you? And the answer is the tithe and the offering. In other words, you've taken that which is holy, which is sanctified according to Leviticus for the use only for the kingdom of God. You've taken that which is holy and you've used it for unholy purposes. You're paying your bills with it. You're taking care of your needs with it. You're not trusting me anymore. You're taking the tithe and the offering, which is holy, and you're using it for unholy purposes, which is bringing the curse back on you. And look what he says. He says, you've robbed me in tithes and offerings. And he says, that's how. And now you're back under a curse. The whole lot of you, because you're robbing me. And so here's gonna tell us, how do you break the curse? Bring your full tithe to the temple treasury. In other words, the full tithe is not 2%, not how much you feel like giving, not whenever you feel like giving. It's the first 10% of everything you're increased to the temple treasury. It means you don't give it to missions. You don't sow it to your grandmother over in Africa. You don't sow it to somebody poor on the streets. That is not where the tithe goes. The tithe always belongs in the storehouse. The storehouse is where you're spiritually taken care of, not the televangelist. Did you hear what I just said? Go ahead and call your televangelist when you get sick and see if they'll come and visit you. See if they'll counsel you when you need counsel. Are you following me? You bring it into the storehouse, and he says, how much of the tithe do you bring in? The full tithe. He has to remind them because, <laughs> well, maybe I'll just give a little bit of this. No, the full tithe into the storehouse, and look at what he says, so that there will be ample provisions in my temple, test me in this, and see if I don't open up heaven itself to you and pour out blessings beyond your wildest dreams. For my part, I will defend you against marauders, protect your wheat fields and vegetable gardens against plunderers. In other words, he says, I will destroy the enemy who's trying to destroy your prosperity. I'm going to take charge over the enemy who's trying to destroy the fruit of your ground. Back then, their tithe was not money. It was, it was crops and animals. They would bring the first animal that was born to the flock. They would bring the first crops that they would pick. They'd bring the best and give the best to God. They never gave God leftovers or after they paid their bills. They always gave God the first. Everybody say first. That's why Jesus said, if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, everything you need will be added to you. So I recognize, when I started studying this out, I recognize the reason that I've had so many problems is because I haven't been a tither and a giver to God. So if I start tithing, not only will he bless me, but he'll bless my family, he'll take care of me. And that's what I've been doing for the last 38 years. And I've been young and now I'm old. But I've never seen righteous people forsaken nor their seed begging for bread. I've never met anybody who is a consistent, faithful tither that's struggling financially all the time. If you're struggling constantly financially, it could have something to do with your faithfulness over the tithe. And some of you say, well, I'm not an Old Testament person. I'm a New Testament person. That's Old Testament. Take me into the New Testament. Why doesn't he talk about tithing in the New Testament? Because it was so taught in the Old Testament, he doesn't need to talk about it in the New Testament. Do you see any teaching in the New Testament about praise and worship? There is only one scripture in the whole New Testament on praise and worship, yet we know we are supposed to praise and worship God from the book of Psalms. Amen? Just because it's in the New and the Old doesn't mean that that's passed away. But in the case you want to be a New Testament giver, which is the most unbelievable giver that I've ever seen in my life. The highest form of giving is the New Testament. It says in Acts 2 that they gave, they went and sold their houses and all their lands and brought all their money into the church 
and gave it to the church and distributed such as had need. I'm looking for some New Testament givers. Come on, somebody. I'm ready for you to give. So don't give me that cop out, well, I'm a New Testament. I just give whatever I feel like. Are you kidding me? Where did you get the idea that you could just do whatever you want with your money? It's not your money. It's God's money. It all belongs to him. The tithe is just simply saying, God, I'm proving to you that I'm fully surrendered to you and I want your covering over my life financially. I don't know how it's working for you, but I know one thing, it works for me. Tithing works for me and I've been a tither all my life and so I found not only do we tithe, but the church tithes and we make sure that God's blessing and protection is over us, not just our finances, but over every aspect of our life keeps our marriage protected. It keeps the devil out of our household, over our kids. Keeps our health good. Keeps my car running long and my house not needing a lot of repairs. It keeps God's hand on it. You want God's hand on it, then you're a tither. If you don't care, if you're gonna do this on your own, then you're on your own. See how you do with the devil. I have no qualms about understanding that I'm not good with money without God. I need God's anointing on me when it comes to that. All right, so on God's hand on my life. Third, fourth reason I tithe is I give because I really believe in the vision of our church. Now, I know this about a lot of churches. A lot of churches are limited in bringing their vision to pass because of the giving in their church. They don't have the resources to do what they wanna do, what God's called them to do. I'm so thankful that's not the case here. We are able to do a lot of things in this church because you are, many of you are very faithful in your giving and I commend you for that. But when God gave us this vision, I got, I got excited about it. This is back in 1990 where he showed me Acts 1-8, you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You shall be a witness of me, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the world. And the Lord said to me, that's a template for the local church for vision. So we sat down and we wrote down our vision and we said there's four areas that God wants to influence tied into those four templates in Acts chapter 1-8, the last words of Jesus. Jerusalem is our family, building strong families. Judea is our community, transforming the community. Samaria is reconciling other cultures, another culture which is reconciling cultures. The uttermost parts of the world is impacting nations. So I get excited about the fact that every time we give to this church, a good portion of the money, at least 20% of it, goes out of this church to do that, and some of it goes inside the church to build strong families. Over the 27 years of victory, we've just seen thousands of families restored and healed, marriages that were gonna be divorced, families that, I've had people that were divorced and they came back together and remarried because they started coming to this church, raising their children in the ways of God instead of the ways of the world, whole families being completely rebuilt by going to church because of giving in this church. I've seen our whole community being transformed. Every weekend, we see people going to the prisons, to the nursing homes, to the different places where there's homeless people, building places, uh, furnishing homes for beat, battered women, building locations for rescuing sex slave uh, addict, uh, people in, the, in our city, helping Gwinnett Crisis Pregnancy Center, forming a new uh, healthcare center right over here that's connected to Good Samaritan now, where we're pr providing healthcare for the poor. Every single week, just cunt countless things that we're doing in the community that you don't actually get to see, but it's happening because you're giving. And every time you give, we're able to do more of that in the community. And then <laughs> reconciling cultures, we have 140 nations here, but beginning to provide op opportunities for other churches and impact other churches, work, working together with Bernice King on Better Together. And we're going to celebrate Martin Luther King's speech. Uh, I have a dream this year, the 50th year of anniversary of that in August. Then we're gonna go to Stone Mountain with one race and we're gonna bring 250 churches in our city together to reconcile culture under a big day of about 40 or 50,000 people this next August. And we're gonna march to the top of the mountain with all these pastors and pray against the spirit of racism in our city and break that spirit off of our city. The place where the place where the Ku Klux Klan was re rebirthed was Stone Mountain. And when Martin Luther King says, I have a dream and he sees ahead, he starts talking about Stone Mountain, we're gonna see some of that dream come to pass in this, in this because you're able to give, we're able to give $100,000 just into that one thing. 
just to that one thing. And then every single week, we're building orphanages, hospitals, uh, places to rescue human trafficking victims. We've got a whole a, a apartment building that we built in Addis Ababa for girls. 40,000 girls in one city block are being trafficked in Addis Ababa. So we built apartment homes to rescue them. We built a church right in the heart of that, paid cash for it because of your giving. And there were 400 girls in the very first service giving their hearts to Jesus. And these girls are getting married, getting jobs, having children, people that would never have a chance unless people here at Victory gave. Your giving's tied into that. Digging water wells is stopping the death rate in, in whole townships, changing it by 60 to 80%, stopping the death rate because you now provide healthy water for some of these villages creating whole kinds of work around the world. Your money is working 24 hours a day, 360 days a week when you give it. It's not sitting in a bank account earning 1.1% interest. Come on, somebody. <laughs> it's not going to things that are not mattering. When you give, that's the greatest investment of all. I give because I love the vision. And then finally, I give because someday I want to hear God say, well done. I want to stand before the Lord. Listen to me carefully. I don't want to stand before the Lord giving an account of my life. I'm 60. I just turned 60 a couple weeks ago. It was a big birthday for me. And so I know I don't look a day over 85. But I, but I, but I remember just after I turned 60, I remember just thinking, I'm 60. Boy, that came fast. But what am I going to do for the rest of my life? Because I'm in the second half. I'm not in the first half. I'm in the second half. Some of you are in the first half. You say, well, I got the second half later on. But when you get 60, you don't have a, second, you don't have a first half. You, you are in the second half. But you realize, I've been playing this game for a long time. I've got a lot of wisdom. I'm, and now I'm probably at the peak of my earning potential, where I can give more than I ever gave before. Peak of my influence potential. There's a lot of opportunity here between 60 and, let's say, whenever I go to be with the Lord. Let me use this wisely because I don't want to stand before the Lord and start to give an account of my life, which all of us will do someday, and God looks at me, and instead of saying, well done, he's going to say, what did you do? You did what? You did what with your money? You, 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 you spent all your money on yourself? You wasted your money? On prodigal living, you, you, you lived high and gave low? You, 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 you lived the Mercedes life and gave the Toyota Volkswagen kind of giving? What kind of giving did you do with your life? Where were you when I taught you this in the church? Were you absent that Sunday? Were you watching online and say, because I'm watching online, I don't have to give? What, what, what were you saying? Are you kidding me? Every one of you watching online, you need to be a tither and a giver. I'm not giving you any out. You can turn me off, but until you do, I'm going to tell you right now, you need to tithe and you need to give to a local church. Quit that hiding behind your computer and get up off your blessed assurance and give God something. <laughs> well, you're going to scare all these people away. What do you scare away? Jesus, what did he think when he was talking to his disciples, said, you want to follow me? You're going to have to give up everything. You're going to have to give it all up if you want to be my disciple. And it says they straight, some of them straight away left him, but he some, had some people that remained with him that changed the world. I'm not after people to take up seats at Victory. We don't have a lot of seats at Victory left over. I'm not after people to take up seats. I'm after people who will do what God's word says. What does God's word say? Because we're, in, we're not in the world's business of protecting ourselves and blessing ourselves. We're in God's business getting it done here in the earth. We've got only a short time to use whatever resource we have to get it done. And when everybody in the church ties and gives, amazing things happen in a church. Powerful things you come to this church, you'll know this is not about making a preacher rich. We don't do that. We don't live like that. We use the money wisely, but we make sure that you understand this is a part of making a church work is our giving. Our giving is so vital in the church. And if everybody does their part, 
God takes your little gift and your offering and your tithe and your, your giving and matches it with hundreds and hundreds of other people to where millions of dollars go into the gospel. Over 50 million have gone out of this church into the gospel in some capacity. 50 million, that's, that's way past my dreams. I never dreamed that much money would come out of this church to the gospel, but it's because of the power of giving. Now, the question is not whether we should give. We all know that biblically we're supposed to give. The question is, do we give? Will we be a tither and a giver? You, have, you, 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 you entered into a dangerous service this Sunday morning because <laughs> now you're held accountable for what you know. You could have claimed all day, I never heard that, I didn't know that. Well, now you have. <laughs> don't be giving me that anymore. I don't know anything about tithing. Yes, you do. People come out to me, I have this need, and I, I can't pay my bills. And I, I, first thing I say, are you a tither? Well, no, I'm not a tither. How long have you been in the church? 10 years. <laughs> you've been in the church 10 years and you're not a tither? I can understand first time, you've, you've never heard the message, but you've been in church 10 years, you've heard a lot of messages. You've heard about giving tithing for many times, and you're not tithing, but you want us to pay your bills. I'm pretty sure God says he will not pay your bills. I'm pretty sure he said that. He said, you're cursed with a curse because you will not obey God. You've heard what God's word says, and you're doing it your way, and you want us to bail you out. If God won't bail you out, I'm not going to bail you out. Did you hear what I'm saying? I'm not going to enable you. That's just the way it is. I'm, we're going to help anybody in, our church, anybody in our church that comes to us with needs and they're faithful and they're tithe, they're faithful to serve in the church, we're going to help them. We're going to help them to some capacity. We may not pay all your bills, but we'll try to help you. But if you're coming and you say, well, I, I'm not, I, I've come here, but I don't tithe, I don't serve, but I want you to take care of me. That's pretty much approach like we have to the government. Government, you need to take care of me. Let's tax all these rich people so I can have my needs met. Are y'all all right out there? I mean, that's not God's way. In fact, I'm pretty sure it's the opposite. In the parable of the talents, he gives one five, one two, one one. The five multiplies five more. The two multiplies two more. And here's what he says. Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many Enter into the joy of the Lord. The one who had one talent said, I knew you were hard and you, you, you're not really fair. And so I took your money and I buried it. I buried it. And here, I'm just going to give it back to you because I didn't really do anything with it. I'm going to give it back to you. And Jesus said, wicked and lazy servant, take from the one and give it to the one who has ten. In other words, not take from the 10 and give it to the one who has one. Take from the one and give it to the one who will actually use it. Who will do the right thing with money instead of bury it, hoard it, hold on to it. Are y'all all right out there? So I want God to say, I don't want God to say, you did what? You wasted your money? You lived this high life and you never gave? You came to church on a regular basis and you never tithed? You never gave your tithe to the Lord. You never served God in your church. You just, you're a taker your whole life, and yet you want to have all the benefits of heaven and all the blessings of heaven. You want it all? That's not how it works, guys. He says, he that is faithful, Luke 16, over the little things, the unrighteous mammon of the earth, can be trusted with the true riches of heaven. If you've been faithful over a little, God can make you ruler over much. If you've been unfaithful over the little you have, then God can't trust you with any more. Your financial life right now is a statement of your faithfulness. It's a statement of your faithfulness to God. And when you look at your finances, you ask yourself, why am I in trouble? It could be because you've been robbing God. You have to be honest with yourself honest with yourself and say, God, I repent. I will not rob you another day. I can't undo what I've done in the past, but I can do what's right in the future. And from this day forward, I'm going to be a tither. I'm going to be a giver. 
I want my heart to be surrendered to you. I want to be thankful all the time. I want to have your hand on my finances. I want to make sure that the vision goes forth. God, I want to be a giver, not a taker. So, Lord, I pray that over us as a people. We bow our heads and close our eyes. I pray that over us, God, that you are helping this church. You're helping this church move into a whole different dimension of giving. We're no longer hoarding our money. We're no longer holding on to what belongs to God. We're releasing it by faith. We're trusting you instead of trusting in the world. Some of us are becoming, about to become faithful in the area of tithing and giving so we can do what you called us to do financially in the earth. And I'm praying for everybody, Lord, everybody, those who've been a tither, those who've not, that you're gonna speak to us in our time of privacy with you, God. You're gonna dress us in our money issues. Help us to learn what are we doing with this money that you've entrusted with us? Are we simplifying our life? Are we, are we just doing things like everybody else in the world, just buying things, charging things, living the high life? while we're here on the earth. And I'm praying for you to strip that out of us, God, and help us to become true, faithful people that have a heart to give, a heart to share, and a heart to bless. I pray that over our church, because when we start to do that, God, we're, our church can do so much more when everybody's tithing and everybody's giving. We can do so much more. And you've got so much ahead of us. And I'm praying that every person in here who's just learning this principle, God, help break the fear, the lack, anything that tries to grip them, any voice of the enemy that tries to steal their heart from God in this area so that they can really operate in the fullness of faithfulness. Who can find a faithful person? You ask the question. I pray you can find them here at Victory. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen and amen. Let's give God all the praise. Come on, let's give him praise.